συνεχίσουμε λοιπόν με την οπίστη αραγωγητήτηδα. Έχουμε ένα πάνελ από πολύ εκλεκτούς καλεσμένους και διάσημους καλεσμένους, α, οι οποίοι θα αναφερθούν σε θέματα, ε, ελπίζω πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέροντα, όταν με το τέλος κάθε διάλεξης θα γίνονται ερωτήσεις, ώστε να, ε, γιατί έχουμε την ευκαιρία τότε να ε, έχουμε την συμμετοχή του μιλητή. Uh, οι δύο ομιλητές είναι, τρεις ομιλητές είναι από την Αμερική, από το Στάνφορτ και το Χάρβαρτ. Υπάρχει uh, zone difference uh, και ας το σεβαστούμε αυτό και γι' αυτό το λόγο uh, uh, πρέπει να ξεκινήσουμε αμέσως. Ξεκινάμε με το Φρανσέσκο Πίτσι. Uh, hi, Φρανσέσκο. How are you? Hello, how are you doing? It's an honor to have you here. We it's, a pleasure, lecture, it's a pleasure. We watched your lecture yesterday. So Francesco Pitti is the Grand Master of Ocular Imaging, and he's going to deliver his talk on over interpreting white dots. Good morning. It's my pleasure today to talk about over interpreting white dots. These are my financial disclosure. When I think of white dots, I think of the English verbs. So sometimes when you see them isolated, they have one meaning, but then you add one small word next to it and they change meaning completely. The same thing to me applies to white dot syndrome. Um, when you talk about white dot syndrome, you have a huge variety of presentation, punched out lesion, placoid lesion, relentless placoid lesion, you have subretinal fluid, um, you have uh, the, the Burchard appearance, uh, you have geographic uh, and serpiginous appearance, uh, but at the same time, you have a masquerade of white dot syndrome. So I'm going to present uh, uh, four cases of masquerade of white dot syndrome and how not to in overinterpret them. The first case is a 12-year-old white female. She presented two months prior with pain in the left eye and started noticing some changes in the vision. No recent travel and the best corrective visual acuity of this uh, left eye is 2040. The, uh, the anterior segment is normal and there's one plus feature cells. This is the presentation uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the baseline. So you can see on uh, Fundus photo, there's lesion of different age um, uh, that progress along the superior arcade. Uh, the FAF reflects the, the different age of the lesion. Some of them are hyper and some of them are hypofluorescent. Uh, fluorescein angiography is not adding a lot. Some lesion, the most recent one, the one that they were hyper, they are uh, slightly leaking in the late phases, but the other ones are just staining. OCT just shows RPE changes, but it's, uh, it's really not telling us a lot. The work up here is a chest x-ray, ACE, TB, and syphilis. Um, a neg a negative is Lyme, blood culture, Bartonella, Toxocara, uh, HSV, HSV, uh, herpes zoster, and CMV. The only positive finding is an ANA, but this is a red herring. The diagnosis at this point is multifocal choroiditis, and the pediatric rheumatologist starts the patient on prednisone, one milligram per kilo. 15 days later, the best corrective visual acuity of this left type improves to 2025. But here's the appearance at baseline, and here is the appearance on pregnancy on 40 milligrams. So now we have new lesions that were fresher lesions that were not present at baseline. The patient continues on prednisone and increases the dose and you see that the lesions actually continue to increase. And uh, after one full month of cortisone, uh, the lesions are actually spread along the superior arcade. So at this point, we have lesion of different ages in unilateral fashion. The whole workup is negative. The new lesions are continuing to appear uh, despite massive steroids. There is a, the only positive finding in the lab is a 1% eosinophil. And so what we can do to help us here is, is have a look at non-wide field color pictures. So this is the color picture representation, and this is our culprit. So at this time point in enlargement, we can see a small worm inside the retina. So this is a case of Dusen masqueradinus multifocal choroiditis. When you look at the retina, you can convince yourself that all kinds of things look like a worm. Uh, having an OCT will make you surely feel better about blasting the worm in the laser. The other option, if you cannot find the laser and you suspect Dusen, is to use albendazole. It produces an intense white spot in the subretinal space about a week later while, while the worm dies. 
Let's move on to the second case. A 70-year-old man with four or five months history of uveitis in the left eye. He's referred to us for systemic evaluation of the Burchett, which is HLA-29 negative. Um, he has uh, uh, glaucoma on Cosmetex and Xalacan, and the past medical history is negative. Now, this left eye is a 2040 vision and a positive APD. Um, here is the appearance of the anterior segment. You can see there are uh, mutton fat KPs nearly in an arch triangle, which are quite weird for a Burchett patient. Um, and here is the appearance of the fundus. So um, uh, there are white lesion uh, distributed, mostly nasal, which do resemble uh, a Burchett, and uh, there's a major degree of vitritis. But on FA, there is zero leakage. So um, it's quite weird to have a unilateral burst in a 60-year-old with no leakage and with inflammation of the anterior segment. The other option could be sarcoidosis, but the ACE is negative. Then we should start thinking of a masquerade here, especially of anoplasia. So um, an ICG and ultrasound is done, as well as systemic evaluation. This is the ICG. So um, as you can see, there are indeed lesions in the choroid that are um, preventing the spreading of the ICG dye, and they're appearing as hypofluorescent, but they're not very well isolated like in Burchard. Some of them are more confluent as well, as you can see here nasally. And uh, B-scan is actually giving us a help for the diagnosis. So you see here there is a hypoechogenic mass uh, close to the optic nerve behind uh, the sclera. Uh, we, we perform an MRI orbit and we see an enhancing of a thick and soft tissue around the left optic nerve. And differential at this point could be lymphoma, sarcoid or pseudotumor. Uh, infection or metastasis are less likely. So at this point, the only way to get a final diagnosis is to perform a, a, a biopsy. We do a vitrectomy and then we do sort of a punched out uh, biopsy of, uh, of these uh, white lesions. Taking a piece, this is the surgical pathology. This is a B cell non-skin lymphoma with features most consistent with MALT. And the treatment here is uh, um, uh, is uh, XRT alone uh, to a dose of 2,520 uh, centigrade to the left orbit. Third case, 78-year-old Caucasian male who presents with painless decreased visual acuity in the right eye for one week. Um, there's no uh, change in the best corrective visual acuity here. Some trace cells in the right eye and the presence of uh, an IOL in both eyes. In the past medical history, has mild cell lung cancer that was uh, uh, treated with chemo radiation in 2008, and an history of uh, uh, acute myeloid leukemia that treated with chemotherapy once. So this is the appearance. You see uh, along the inferior arcade there are white dots with a small dot hemorrhage um, next to them. And these white dots are present uh, along the uh, supranasal uh, um, uh, periphery and are also present um, along the nasal periphery. So you see their white uh, plaque with the hemorrhagic dots next to them. Now here, the working diagnosis is pointing towards an infection. This could be for sure uh, um, a case of herpes retinitis. So we, we perform intravitreal phoscarnate in this patient, and we get at the same time a vitreous PCR that comes, comes back negative. Um, the serum assay only shows IgG for uh, zoster. Um, there's, so we do not perform at this point any treatment with any gun cyclovir implant. But then the patient with this uh, appearance detaches. Uh, he returns with a macular involving retinal detachment and he undergoes uh, sclerobacular and PPV with silicone oil placement. Um, at this point, we repeat PCR during the surgery for herpes, but again, it all comes back negative. Um, after uh, silicone oil and vitrectomy, this is the appearance of this right eye. You can see the laser, and among them, among the laser areas, there's these white plaques with the hemorrhagic uh, uh, dots, and they're actually increasing in, um, in size and spreading. Uh, at this point, the only way is to take a piece, since the systemic evaluation for herpes, tox, or Lyme, syphilis is negative. Um, the retina biopsy is scheduled, and it results with a small cell carcinoma involved in the retina. Case four, the final case is 16 year old female. The past medical history shows difficulty coordinating movements since she was a, a child. She's a bit clumsy when walking. Um, in uh, the past ocular history shows of talnoplasia and saccades. She's referred for uh, diagnosis of multifocal choroiditis or AMPI. 
Um, now, this is the appearance of the right eye. You can see there are um, multiple areas of the pigmentation, RP changes, um, that are reflected on autofluorescence. You see, um, autofluorescence shows a speckled hyper and hypoautofluorescence, but the margins are still a bit hyper, so this may be considered active. And um, uh, fluorescein angiography shows staining of these areas. OCT proved that the RP is indeed remodeled everywhere, and there's a bit of a loss of the ellipsoid zone. Same things uh, is for the left eye, as you can see here in fluorescein angiography, the areas are staining. So the patient is diagnosed with arpeginous choroiditis. She's deemed active and started of azotyper in 100 milligram per day. It's a bit weird to have arpeginous choroiditis like this in a young kid. But at this point, the patient is sent to me one year later. So you can see on autofluorescence, compared to the first picture, you can see there is more profound loss of uh, um, the RPE in the, in the macular area, which is reflected on, high, on a high hypo autofluorescence. Um, here, again, you can see that the RPE is starting to disappear. There's a hyperreflectivity uh, a cone of hyperreflectivity uh, at the macular area on OCT, which proves that the RPE is indeed disappearing. Same thing is applied for the left eye. Um, you see here in the center of the macular area a profound hypotofluorescence. And again, here there's nearly a complete aurora uh, in, uh, in the center of the, of the macula. At this point, she's still active. But there's something going on, but she's also uh, miserable on azathioprine. We have two areas of um, autofluorescence, of hypo autofluorescence. One, which is the yellow one, where the RP is surely suffering, but still there, is still present. And one here with a white asterisk, where the RP is indeed dead. So at this point, miserable from azathioprine with hepatic function all over the roof, we have to rethink this white dot syndrome and think of a masquerade. So I stopped as a tyoprin. The dysmetria and the ataxia with unstable tandem uh, were pointing towards a consult for the, with the genetic service. So the lab work showed uh, a, a repeat for uh, uh, sp uh, spinocerebellar ataxia 7 uh, with 39 CHE expansions. It was evaluated by a neurologist and it was found to have a spinocerebellar ataxia. So this is the cause of the retinal manifestation uh, secondary to the spinocerebellar ataxia 7. And uh, last week, the patient came, she's 24 to 20, 50, quiet, off drops, and off is a type ring for more than one year. This is the appearance, she's stable, she has uh, geographic atrophy in the center um, with hypo fluorescence and changes uh, in the OCT with complete aurora. Same thing applies for the other eye with the hypo fluorescence and complete aurora in the center with a more profound loss here on OCT. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. Um, before we take questions from the audience, John, one quick, quick question for, uh, for, for you. I noticed that uh, you're using the Optos. I don't have experience with Optos. I am about to get a Clarus now in uh, January. Uh, but I noticed that you have to go and look back at uh, 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 a conventional, not wide field photo. So how often do you use that? I mean, uh, do you rely on wide field imaging because sometimes the resolution is not uh, that good or maybe you're missing some info? How so um, I, I love wide field. Um, I, I rely on wide field. Let's talk color photo first. Uh, I think the Clarus you're getting, and I have no financial interest in this, the Clarus you're getting is, uh, is amazing. It's uh, probably slightly better compared to Optus, even if the field of view is slightly smaller. Um, Optus is great for us who do UVitis because you can see up to nearly 200 degrees. But of course, as you say, the finer details you cannot really tell. So the case of Dusen, uh, we had to get uh, um, these uh, non-wide field photos to get the finest details. And then there's the problem of uh, fluorescein and geography. You know, with Optus, you see so much on fluorescein. Like in the periphery, you see sometimes in a patient with uveitis, very mild leakage, but you don't know if it's active, if you should treat. So we see a lot, but we're still trying to interpret. So I have to say I rely on it, but I have to use a bit of a grain of salt. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, good evening. Thank you for good your evening. contribution in our, uh, to our Congress. Uh, I have a question. A question. Uh, since uh, we have many paraneoplasmatic syndromes, paraneoplastic syndromes, like uh, uh, in cases of metastasis, 
or in cases of uh, true paranoplasmatic syndromes, uh, the question is, I, or we have the possibility of a vitreoretinal lymphoma, the question is, if you use in your clinical practice, before biopsy, etc., cetera, uh, flow cytometry of intraocular fluids in order, in order to be orientated in your diagnostic procedure? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially in cases when you have a lot of uh, uh, vitreous debris and uh, you want to try to interpret them better. Now, in the case, for example, the Bershot masquerade, um, those clumps of um, in the vitreous, they weren't really suspicious for, from, for lymphoma to me. Uh, and plus, I've never seen lymphoma present uh, in this Bershot appearance. I'm talking about primary uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma uh, B cell. Um, but yes, definitely, if there's uh, stuff to be gotten in the, in the vitreous or in the aqueous, then yes. Uh, before going directly for a, for a retinal or retinal biopsy, I try to be less invasive as possible. Thank you so much, Francesco.